um, and thanks for being here. I am delighted to uh, be on stage with my friend Rajesh Hade to introduce his new book, um, Where the Line is Drawn. It's this, if you haven't read it. And um, Raja is a Palestinian writer, and he's also a, a lawyer. He's written over 10 books, um, among them several law books and memoirs. Raja is also uh, a founding member of an organization called Al Haq, which is a very important Palestinian human rights organization that documents uh, the systematic abuses of uh, the Israeli um, government and military authorities. Um, I thought we would start with a reading that will kind of give you a flavor of the book and, and introduce the premise. Um, Raja is a wonderful reader, and I think uh, this passage will really sort of set the tone for, for what's to come. But I wonder though, could we, um, is it possible to close the doors? Because I know uh, it, it can be really distracting when you're reading if there's a lot of noise. Well, thank you, Susan. You can all hear me, I hope. I will read from the very first chapter, which is called The Stamp Collector. The book uh, spans the entire uh, period of the Israeli occupation, 50 years, but this chapter begins before the Israeli occupation, and it's in uh, Ramallah 1959. So the stamp collector. He looked too large for the cramped house. He always left his slippers under the bed, brought up his short, stocky legs, and folded them underneath him. It was only there, on the bed, with its gleaming white sheet stretched over a large mattress that he seemed to have enough room for his corpulent body. This was the first house my parents and sister came to live in after they were forced out of Jaffa. How crowded it must have been. I am eight years old and sprawled on the bed with my uncle. I occupy only a small space at one corner of the bed. His stamp collection is spread over the mattress, stamps of all sizes, large and small, squares and rectangles, with differently colored, serrated edges. Among them, I see one with strange, angular lettering. It looks ancient, pharaonic. I read the small Arabic script, Israel. When I point, it, point to it, my uncle puts his stubby finger to his mouth and whispers, hush. He turns his head to look around him as if to see whether anyone has overheard us. Silently, I scrutinize the stamp more carefully. I'm curious about the image on it. It is of an extended arm with strong fingers gripping an orange and white flower. What sort of body produces such a grip? I imagine broad shoulders and thick rippling muscles. Could that unreachable land be peopled by giants? There is writing on the side in Roman script, which I cannot read. I ask my uncle to translate it, and he tells me it is French for, quote, the conquest of the desert. I ask what conquest means, and he explains. I had, of course, heard of Israel, but I knew nothing about it other than what I had heard from my cousin Amal, who lived there in Acre. Pointing to the hills next to our house, the only home I knew, she had once said, you see these hills that are brown? In Israel, they would all be green. She and my Aunt Mary, who spoke fast and was constantly puffing on a cigarette, were permitted to visit us but just for a few days at a time. I never saw my male cousins because only women were allowed to cross the green line, the border until 1967 between Israel and Jordan. Jordan had annexed East Jerusalem and the West Bank in 1950. They seemed so wretched, their hair uncombed, their demeanor tense, demanding. Their visits were fleeting, 
they would come through the Mendelbaum Gate in Jerusalem to celebrate Christmas with us. Not every year, only when they succeeded in getting a permit from the Israeli authorities. They never knew until the last minute whether or not they would be allowed to cross, and when they did, their visits would be so rushed they could hardly catch their breath. They were only allowed to stay for 48 hours. Then they would gather their things and whatever they had managed to buy, Turkish coffee cups were especially desirable, and they would leave us as quickly as they had come. The house would then return to calm, and there would be lengthy discussions about them and their visit. Life in Israel seemed so difficult. We couldn't possibly envy them for living among hills that were greener than ours. My uncle worked in Kuwait. I did not appreciate then what it meant to work in the desert without air conditioning. He said they had to sit in a barrel of cold water because it was so hot. To amuse himself in the desert, he collected stamps. He would rub his red eyes and then slowly pull the beautifully preserved stamps from between the transparent pages of his album. When he reached his most prized stamp, his eyes would open wide. He would hum and exhale slowly through pursed lips, taking his time as he slowly raised his stamp and held it up in front of my eyes. Now this one, this one is very precious, he would say, holding it carefully between the tips of his chubby fingers. He would turn it around and gaze at it with admiration. But this one, he would say, picking up the stamp from Israel, we must hide. Now, half a century later, having made countless crossings into the once forbidden land, I realize how unaware I had been at the time of what Israel would come to mean to me over the years. For 19 years after the catastrophe of 1948 or the Nakba, when around 750,000 Palestinians were forced out of their homes and Arab villages were razed to the ground with the end of the British Mandate and the establishment of Israel, we lived in the part of historic Palestine under Jordanian rule. How could we have known then that in a few years Israel would occupy our land, that over the years we would cross its borders so frequently and that our entire life would come to be dominated by the country with the unmentionable name. Thank you. Um, one, a couple of things from that passage when I was reading the book that, um, that stood out for me was this idea of conquest of the desert, how it, the kind of propaganda that reduced um, our society basically to nothing. Um, and another, another detail was the, um, the green line um, I want to explain, first of all, the green... Maybe you can explain what the green line is. Do, do you all know what that is, the green line? After 1948, when Israel was established in the part of Palestine, which was much larger than what the partition scheme of... the UN partition scheme of 1947 gave to the Jewish state, uh, there were uh, armistice uh, negotiations, and a, a line was drawn uh, between uh, what became Israel and Jordan, uh, which took over the, the West Bank. And that has been called the Green Line right. misnomer. Right. <laughs> so, so I always knew, of course, that this Green Line um, was the first separation, the first fragmentation of Palestinian society. But the detail in there that only women were allowed to cross, at first no one was allowed to cross, and then they started allowing some people to cross. And, and like Raja said, it was only for... Um, for uh, 48 hours, but I, um, I want to, uh, I wonder if you could comment about what that meant, because Palestinian society uh, is so, it, it was so predicated on the family structure, and, and that was the basis of our, of our, of our lives, and, it, and the family wasn't just, you know, the mom and dad and kids, but it was the cousins and the aunties, and, and the great aunties and the grandmothers and so forth. And, and everybody lived close and everybody knew each other. And we all, um, uh, much, is the way, much the way it is in India, you know, it was, and, and that structure is what held our society together. And so this, this first fragmentation of Palestine um, was the green line. And can you talk a little bit about what that meant 
for your family, first of all, for you know, just the women crossing? Et well, it, it simply meant that all my cousins who, who were, by the way, the reason why this family whose daughter was called Amal stayed in, in, uh, in uh, Aker, Aker, was that they had a, a baby girl, Amal was a baby girl, and she had typhoid. And, uh, and that was why they stayed, because they didn't want to uh, take her, uh, because she was very sick. And throughout the years, I never met my co male cousins. And the only time I did meet them was in the United States many years later, and they were like strangers to me. And, and uh, the unfortunate thing is that that kind of separation is still continuing, because Palestinians are not allowed who are outside of the occupied territories and Israel are not allowed even to come for a visit, as is the case with you now. You are not allowed to come for a visit. And uh, this means that many families are separated and, and there are so many tragic stories of families who have never met family members for many, many, many years and never might, might never meet them until they die. Now, this is not a unique situation because in South Korea and North Korea, there are family separations India and, and Pakistan, I think there are uh, some cases of families who have been separated, or friends who have been separated. But what is unique about Palestine is that not only is it a separation, but it, it's a denial of the existence of the entire nation. And so you can sometimes deal with the separation if you still have your, your country, but we neither have the country nor have, do we have family unification. Um, that was actually, you, you preempted my, my next question. Um, the, this initial sort of fragmentation, which was actually followed by subsequent fragmentations, and, um, and like Raja said, we all ended up, those of us who left, my family included, in another, in, in, in another war in 1967, ended up kind of being scattered all over the world, unlike what happened with partition. People either ended up on one side or another, and and you still felt you were still in your in your country. You know, you were in it. Well, you were in your milieu, in your cultural milieu, with people who looked like you, who ate the same food more or less, who who listened to the same kind of music more or less, who dressed similarly. Um, but with Palestinians who left, it created this diaspora that was so uh, that that became so so different culturally. A lot of us adopted the cultures of our hosts, even though, you know, we remain Palestinian. There's a really, there's a lovely passage in the book, and I wonder if you would read it for us. It's on, on page um, 40, where you, you quote uh, a man named Halim, who goes back to, uh, he, he's someone who, I guess, went to the West and uh, became very prosperous, did very well, made a lot of money, but then he goes back to visit his childhood home, and he and he's so uh, discombobulated. And there's a part in there that um, really illustrates this sort of dissonance that we all feel about uh, just this tug. So I'll, I'll just I think it speaks for itself. I'll let you read it. This is from the uh, chapter called "Visiting uh, Jaffa," in which. It was a chapter that was difficult to write because I tried to uh, present the various positions about leaving Jaffa, which, which was one very important urban center in Palestine in the life of the Palestinians. And, and uh, out of 70,000, population of 70,000, only about 2,000 stayed. And uh, Halim has been in the United States and was able to come back after the Oslo agreements were made and he says, as I saw more of the town, I began to be obsessed by a single question. Why did we leave? The few bombs that had been thrown at the Manshiye quarter seemed like nothing compared to what Beirut had experienced in 1982. The Lebanese had not abandoned their city in mass. Why had we? Why did we leave everything and just go? What sort of people were we to have taken off, leaving everything behind? The particulars of that moment began to come back. How my father, always a stubborn man, refused to go and my mother pleaded with him to leave. My father then fell silent. In their exile, he and my mother became estranged, as though he blamed her for tricking him into leaving. This was harder for me than anything I had gone through until then. I lost not only Jaffa, but my parents as well. In retrospect, 
I wonder what it would have been like if we had stayed. It was true that my parents were older and might have been able, not have been able to endure the hardships of staying, but I could have. Why didn't I insist on remaining in our house and taking care of our property? What could the Israelis have done to me? Impose a curfew, restrict my movements? I've experienced all this and worse in the war in Lebanon. For three months, I was trapped in Beirut and couldn't leave. If I had stayed in Jaffa, I might not have been able to afford expensive houses around the world, but the whole world would have meant little to me if I had my Jaffa. I went to Rabie, the highest place in the city, and looked out to the sea. No other sea was as beautiful or as blue. The memories began to flood back. I could almost see myself still slim and muscular in my bathing trunk swimming out far into the sea. I had to rest. I was feeling out of breath. I found a low wall and leaned against it. Across the wall, I saw the cemetery where so many of my fr father's friends who had died before 1948 were buried. My whole life seemed a waste. I concentrated on the sea and tried to follow the movements of my young self from our house down the hill into the sea. In every place I've been, what I had, what I had was what I could afford to buy. I looked for the best and bought it. But this place has a meaning to me that no amount of money could buy. All the money I had amassed could not buy me the feeling of being home. This was the home that I would never be able to replace with any other. When I walked up to the door of that house, I did not know what to expect. It was just a whim. I remembered that the Khadars and their two daughters had lived there. I used to like walking by this house after school in the hope that I would see them standing there in the garden. The house looked inha inhabited and, was, and I was conscious, curious to find out what was now, who was now living in it. I knocked. Leila, one of the two daughters, opened the door. Her sister Nadia, Nadia appeared at her side. They had always been on the plump side, but now they were practically round. I introduced myself. When they heard my name, they jumped with joy and asked me in. As I sat in their living room with the handsome floor-length window and had a view of the sea, I could hardly believe I was there. Their house had the aura of an old Jaffa house. It was as though nothing had changed. Lemonade, they asked me. They seemed to speak in unison. Leila disappeared and returned with a tall glass of freshly squeezed lemonade made from the lemons growing on a tree in their backyard. She had added a few leaves of mint. A white crocheted napkin was carefully folded underneath the glass. They asked me about my life. I told them. As I spoke, I was aware that I was speaking about exile to those who had refused to be exiled. All the time, I continued to think how fortunate they were. I both admired and envied them. How trite and empty my life must seem to them. They had never left their beautiful house on Rabie overlooking the sea. All the time I spoke, they listened to me with unwavering interest. I asked them about their life. Leila said, and there was sadness in her voice, as you can see, we never left. Mother was ill at the time, and we did not want to disturb her. Father thought nothing could be worse for us than to leave our house. If need be, we would die here. We lost both our parents in 1960, and ever since we have been living on our own. Not a day passes when we don't ask each other, why didn't we leave? Most of the people who left have done so well for themselves. We stayed here alone in a dead and empty city. There used to be 70,000 people living in here. Now there are only around 2,500 of the original Jaffa people. None of our friends stayed. As you see, we are still single. We have no friends. We have kept our house, but we have also lost our community, our life. I, um, 
when Raj and I were talking about this panel, I, I insisted that he read that because um, I actually got a little bit teary uh, uh, when, I, when I was reading that because it really illustrates how um, every Palestinian, I think, asked that question, um, especially those, what, what would happen? What if I had left? What if I had stayed? And or what if my, in my case, what if my family had stayed? Because I was uh, born after the 67 war. But I think um, this passage really illustrates how 1948 for us uh, is still ongoing. It's this year that just has not ended. And I think it's because, you know, we, we, we still exist in this state where not only um, are we, uh, it, has, our, has, our, has our country, our lives and history been stolen, but um, our whole existence is denied. And there is this kind of collective feeling of wanting to, to prove that we exist. And so we keep going back to 1948. And earlier today, um, I was doing an interview after a, a previous panel, and uh, the, a journalist asked me, why, why is it, um, why do you write mostly about contemporary Palestine going back to just you know, pre-Israel to, to modern day? And a lot of Palestinian writers really kind of just keep examining this period. And as I was really thinking about questions for, for Raja's, uh, for this talk, um, I, I thought of the answer later, of course, as I always do. <laughs> um, but this is really it. We're, we, there is this sort of impulse to prove that we exist, I feel. Um, do you, do you, is that true for you? Well, that's true because uh, it has never stopped, as you have said. The Nakbi has never stopped. I live in the occupied West Bank in Ramallah. And, and the Nakbi is ongoing because they are still trying their best to make our life so difficult to encourage us to leave. They are taking the land and building settlements and, and, and saying this is our land regardless of how long you have been here and regardless of your history. And Israel has constructed, not only took the, the land, but constructed myths to prove that they were here and we were not. And, and they continue to refuse to acknowledge the existence of the Palestinians as a nation. To the extent that in Israel, a law has been passed making it illegal to commemorate the Nakbi, the, the expulsion, which is the most important uh, uh, event in the, in the life of, 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 our peop of our people. Yeah, so I mean, it's essentially, it, it would be like making it illegal to talk about partition, for example. Here. Yeah. Um, there's a, there's a, a line that, um, in, on page 11, where you, you very, in, in passing, say, you know, talk about how your father won uh, a court case against, Bar against Barclay Bank, um, which allowed Palestinian refugees to finally access their bank accounts after uh, like some six or seven years. And um, I wanted to bring that up because I think it illustrates how, you know, people, when people think about uh, the establishment of Israel and the Nakba, um, the expulsion of Palestinians, it's, you know, we only think about the theft of the land, the theft of homes, um, but it was so much deeper. I mean, it was, it was the confiscation of people's bank accounts. It was the, the theft of their furniture, their clothes, their photographs, importantly, their books, um, and, and, their, and our culture, our history. So it was, there were so many layers of the theft and the denial, um, and I thought that I, thought, I think it's important to just bring that up and, and, um, uh, and talk about you know, this, this court case. And it's something that um, people don't really ever understand about our anguish. Um, we're often told, well, just get on with your lives. Um, and there's a, there's, a, there's a great passage in the book um, when, when, a, when an Israeli friend named Sarah uh, when you, I think you bring it up in conversation and, you ha and she gives this long monologue. I'd like you to read that if... Um, uh, uh, by the way, the book is... is uh, the subtitle of the book is Crossing Boundaries in Occupied P Palestine. And it has a number of encounters with, uh, with Israelis who became friends and, and how that friendship went through many stages of being difficult to sustain at times and... and, and asks the question whether friendship can exist outside of politics. 
Uh, and uh, amongst the people I visit when I go to Jaffa and describe it in the, uh, what, what page is that? Um, Sarah, I thought you marked it. I think it's uh, page 47, 46. And uh, one of the people I uh, visited in Jaffa was uh, a colleague lawyer whose wife is called uh, Sarah. And, uh, and uh, in, in, in the evening that I was there, I slept at their house and it was an, uh, an Arab house. And uh, Sarah told me, when I first moved to Jaffa, to, to the Arab house, many of my friends were deeply disappointed. They could not understand how a lefty like me could move into an Arab house. I cannot explain it. I just felt a strong attraction to the old city. What is this self-righteousness, this condemnation? I don't understand it. These very same people teach it at Tel Aviv University, which is built over the ruins of an Arab village. Why is it that it's all right there, but it's not all right to live in a beautiful old Arab house? Then you must understand how Palestinian refugees, like my own family, feel, I said. They yearned to return to their homes. Sarah's tone changed abruptly. Listen, she said. In the Second World War, there were so many displaced communities, so many borders changed, so many people were uprooted. Europe is brimming with displaced communities. But wherever they ended up, they all picked up and continued with their lives. They didn't languish in refugee camps, living off aid like the Palestinians, living in shacks, for God's sake, dependent on handouts. What is this holding on to the past? It's despicable. Why don't you get on with your life? It's pathetic. Look at us, how well we've managed to survive on charity, for God's sake, for three decades. Thank you. Um... I, I was, that was another point where I had to put the book down because I was so angry. <laughs> and, um, you know, Israelis have so many ways of justifying what they did and so many, so many ways of, of coming out innocent too and not having to acknowledge what they did. Um, not acknowledging that they live, that she's living in a, Pal in a, in a Palestinian home and what pain it no, she does recognize, but she doesn't think there's anything that, wrong. That there's with anything it. wrong. That's yeah. what I mean. Not yeah. acknowledging what that actually means. Yeah. The impact on it. Mm. Exactly. Um, so, can you? I mean, I was imagining being in that situation, and I, I think I would have just had to throw water at her or something. I'm, I'm, I always marvel at how how tolerant and accepting and open you can be. I mean, because. Like you understand what this, like how deep this pain is that we feel to see another people just come and take everything and pretend like it was all theirs and knowing that you have literally hundreds if not thousands of years of history and you can prove it. You have the birth certificates, the property deeds, the trees that your grandfathers and great grandfathers planted and so forth. How do you, what do you do? I mean, how, how does this work for you internally? Well, I think our, one of the failures that we had is that we dismissed Israel. And as I was growing up in, in, in school, we were not taught anything about Israel. We were taught about the geography of Palestine as if Israel did not exist. And we were taught about uh, Lake Hule, which is uh, uh, north of Lake Tiberias, as if it still existed when the Israelis had drained it. And, and, and so when Israel occupied us, we were not prepared for encountering Israelis and Israel and, and, and being strong enough to defend ourselves. And so I had a strong sense in the beginning of the occupation, and this happened in the beginning of the occupation, of trying my best to understand the other side. And, and so I, went to, I, I wanted to spend the night there to visit, to hear them, to give them a chance to speak, and I didn't go to fight. We had, I, I went to learn. And I thought it was very important to learn and to see how they think, what they think of us, and so on. And, and that gave me more strength, I think. More so than if I had uh, fought and, and left abruptly and, and didn't want to hear them out. I mean, do you, has that, do you think that has, um, if more people had done that, do you think that would have been beneficial? Do you think Israel would have had a different plan? 
No, they wouldn't have, but I think uh, uh, what, I, what I've noticed is many people whom Israel is trying to uh, cultivate amongst the, the Arab world, they, they bring them over to Israel secretly, even though uh, there's no relation, uh, diplomatic relations between Israel and these Arab states. Mm -hmm. And they show them all the good sides of Israel. And because they are unprepared and they haven't done their work and don't understand what Israel is really about, they fall for it. Yeah. And, and, and then uh, if, they, if you hear them speak, they, they uh, uh, speak about Israel as if it's, it's the... Yeah. And I'm afraid something of this is happening in this country too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we've seen all the billboards, the, you know, we love Israel billboards, and it's, it's actually really painful. Um, it is for me, I'm sure it is for you too, to, to see that in, in a country that had um, historically been, uh, uh, been very pro-Palestine and... Um, Great solidarity with Palestine. Exactly. Had, right. Um, particularly post-colonial era, um, there was a lot of rhetorical and material solidarity that was reciprocal. Um, I, I, I'd like to shift a little bit and talk about, um, we have just a few minutes before we open it up to the audience for questions. You, there's, there's several passages in there that sort of really drive home how, how, how living under occupation just is so consuming, whether it's waiting, you know, three hours in line uh, just to make a 20-minute trip just across a checkpoint when, you know, there are Israeli settlers going and coming so freely. There's a scene in there where you, you, you pick up a small fossil and it's a lovely little piece that you have in your pocket and later you're, you know, you're confronted by soldiers and you're, and you're scared that they're going to find this and think it's a weapon. Um, and then there's this scene in the book, uh, and, and I'd like you to talk about this and, and possibly read if you, if you have the page, um, where you're having dinner and y you and Penny need to get back. And, and it's kind of this constant looming occupation and it, where you can't even, you have to think twice about picking up a beautiful rock or, or having a dinner with friends. So maybe set, set this up for us and, and talk about this kind of all-consuming occupation. This was during one of the uh, difficult times uh, in, 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 in our history. And so many difficult times are, are there. Uh, but we had gone to Jerusalem to, to see some friends and to have dinner. And after we dined and visited friends, we had not seen since the West Bank had been sealed off. And the West Bank was sealed off in, in, uh, in uh, 2000. I was amazed how quickly you can forget about the occupation and all the restrictions Israel had imposed on us. Because when I looked at my watch, it was already 9.30. Our respite was over. We had only half an hour to get to the Kalendia checkpoint before it closed. We drove as though demons were pursuing us. When we got there, we found two other cars ahead of us. One was allowed through, we didn't know why, while the other was forced to turn back. When our turn came, we were apprehensive. We live in Ramallah, I said. We want to get back home. I can't let you. It's past 10 o'clock. The checkpoint closes at 10. I looked at my walk clock on the dashboard. But it isn't 10 yet, I said. It's 10.49, the soldier said. I remembered that Israel had already changed to summertime. The Arafat-run Palestinian Authority had decided to delay turning forward the clock for no apparent reason except perhaps to distinguish Palestine from Israel. But you've just let that car through, I said. Yes, because we, he had a pregnant woman. It's not a big, big deal to let us pass. We're tired and we just want to get home. But the soldier would not budge and we were not in the mood for pleading or told stories about sick family members. You could go through Surda, the soldier said, suggesting that we use back roads. But it wouldn't be safe at this hour. For you, it would. You're not Israeli, the soldier said, as though cars in the dark blinked their ethnic origins. Then I thought of my lawyer's card and presented this to the soldier. He had a pleasant face and was wearing dark glasses, even though it was night. 
He examined it, then looked at me and said, but it wouldn't be fair to let you through just because you're a lawyer and not to allow others. Would now, would it? That's extraordinary. I mean, it wouldn't be fair. Here are these people, these foreign soldiers from a, from, from a conquering land. Most of them are from Europe or from Russia or what have you. And, and you are this native, and he's, and he's telling you what's fair and what's not fair. It's, it's, it's so and after violating international law across the board. <laughs> <laughs> Is it fair for you to shoot at young boys who are unarmed? Um, okay. Just three minutes, there's a part of the book that's actually very important, and I just want to bring this up. And maybe you don't have to read it, but just tell us about it. Um, Raja, um, one of the things that Raja uh, does is he's a walker. And, and he, he wrote this wonderful book called Palestine Walks, where he talks about you know, what it's meant to walk in, in Palestine's hills for him. It's, it's a kind of a meditative, and, uh, and when you read it, you understand that walking the hills alone in Palestine is a kind of a center of gravity for Raja. And there's a part in the book where, um, you know, slowly these hills are taken over and settlements are built and, and there's this sort of monument to an Israeli settler who was killed. Um, and, and I don't know, I think you should tell it because it was, it was so poignant. I, it was another moment when I had to put the book down and, and just kind of think about that. It's in the chapter called Israel at, the, at my doorstep. And it li literally was at my doorstep because it was about five kilometers away from where I live that the Israeli uh, settler was killed somehow. I, I'm not, anyway, the, the, the settlers decided because he was killed there, they're going to establish a settlement there. And, and they uh, brought some uh, uh, cement and, and started a, a settlement. The army was not happy that they would start a settlement there because it was very close to, to Ramallah and it would be difficult to secure and so on. And as a result of their intention to build a settlement, the road was closed, the road which linked Ramallah with in the next village in Kenya, which was a, a, the place with a spring and where we w went to walk a lot. And, and so it meant that instead of the cars going through that road, the, uh, the road was blocked for something like 10 years, we, we had to find other ways to, to get to Ankenia and to get to that uh, uh, spring. And it also meant that taking walks in that region became rather uh, unsafe because the, the soldiers could suspect you and shoot you without any reason. In any case, uh, there was uh, an attempt, a stronger attempt by the settlers to, to establish the settlement and the army decided enough is enough, we will not allow them to build a settlement here and they evacuated them. And uh, I noticed that the cars were passing through so I went to check how, how come the pa cars are passing through and I realized that the, the, the outpost, it wasn't really a settlement, the outpost had been demolished and there was a, a sign still of the settlement uh, still standing and I thought I should get my camera and take a photograph, but I'm not a great photographer. So then I looked down and there was a sign, uh, a billboard of, of the settlement saying, uh, blessed are those who come here. And I thought that would be a good mem memorial for the settlement and I'll pick it up. And I bent down to pick it up and the moment I bent down to pick it up, I was overcome with a sense of great, great fear and I, my heart started pounding. And I realized that, that entry into that world of the settlement on my land was, I had to break a, 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 a great uh, veil and, and uh, line in order to cross it. And I realized that the, set, the hills had become a, almost like a dangerous place for me where I can no longer go for walks without feeling apprehensive of the presence of the settlers and the soldiers all around me. And, and that was a, a sad realization. Yeah, it was for me too, and, I th and, and very tragic and symbolic. Um, I'm gonna start taking questions now. We'll start with you, um, the gentleman here, and then the gentleman, uh, and if there are women, and, and you, okay. Uh, 
Hello, ma'am. Hello, sir. I'm myself an aspiring author, sir. So, listening to your writing has been an honorable, very honoring experience for me. So, thank you for that. So, my question to you, I'd like to you to answer it not as a Palestinian, but as a writer. That when you're taking up a subject that is such, such a touchy subject or as a controversial subject as this one, is it all right to present one side of the narrative? Or do we have a responsibility to present both the sides? Please don't mind me asking this, but what I'm asking is, is it a responsibility for a writer to also show narratives of Jewish family who ran off from Europe to find a place for themselves and suddenly find all the Arab worlds declaring war on them just for existing on that land? Is that such, are those kind of stories also a responsibility of a writer to present when they're presenting such narratives? Please, sorry if that is a wrong question. I do not know what is a wrong question as such. Thank you. Okay, so the, the acoustics are really difficult. I just want to repeat to make sure that I have heard correctly. Are you saying, is it, does a writer have a responsibility to write what you said, the other side? That's it, okay. And show the perspective of Jewish soldiers or, or Jewish families and so forth, so. And after you answer, I'd like to say something about that. Well, it, it's a book that is very hopeful because it, it presents the possibility of uh, understanding of both sides through the friendships and, and makes it known that it is, it is, except for the politics, there's no reason why the two sides are fighting each other. So uh, unlike many of the books that are written by Zionists from entirely the Zionist point of view without any attempt at, uh, this is not that kind of a book at all. So I, I actually reject this language of sides, of both sides. It's like saying that there are two sides to apartheid, two sides to slavery. You know, they, they, you have, you have a, a military occupation of, of one of, of the most uh, sophisticated militaries in the world pitted against a civilian population that is principally unarmed, that is native to the land, and, 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 is, and, and this military is intent on literally destroying, destroying all presence in the world and stealing and taking everything from them. And I think when you talk about sides, you give the impression of parity. This isn't like India and Pakistan, two nuclear armed countries with, with similar strength and stuff. This is, this is, a, this, this is a, an extremely powerful entity pitted against people who are powerless, essentially. Yeah. But, I, I can't hear, but. Never mind, go, go for another question. And so, you know, and, I, and, and the other thing is to, I, you know, I have a truth as a native daughter, and it is not my, it is not my, do, it is not my job, nor it is my inclination or my interest to to explore the people who who uh, and, and explore the lives of the people who who have their boots on my neck when when their boot is on my neck, do you, if that makes any sense. And and I don't think it should be. Uh, uh, I'm a novelist, and and. And no, I, it's not the writer's responsibility to present the truth of the people who are destroying them. Um, so I'm going to take a question from you, and then we had a woman here, and then you're next. Uh, first off, I just want to say that we, a large section of society here, do support the cause of Palestine, and will do whatever we can to support the cause of Palestine till its just conclusion. My question is uh, uh, tied to the larger context. I just want to say that uh, I just want to ask the comments on you uh, regarding uh, the, the idea that Muslims have been uh, not just the other, it, it is the invisible other. We are the problems of everyone and somehow we are the problems of no one. Uh, so if you can share what, uh, see, we can see this happening in, uh, in the Palestinian issue, the issue of uh, the migration issues, similarly the Rohingyas issue. So, so we are the problems of everyone and somehow at the same time we are problems of no one. If you can tie this up uh, and that will be a uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, again, the acoustics. So what I heard was um, sort of tying up the, uh, the issue of sort of exclusion and marginalization of Muslims worldwide with the issue of Palestine. Is that correct? Okay, I apologize, but it's, it's, I hope you guys are hearing us better than we're hearing you. Are you hearing us okay? All right, okay. So basically, I mean, he's saying that um, 
you know, the oppression of Muslims and sort of pushing Muslims and demonizing and dehumanizing Muslims worldwide um, uh, is a phenomenon. And can you tie that to, I guess, to, to Palestine, correct? And, and what's happening in, in, in our part of the world. So, in, and I can answer too if you, if when you, when you're done. You go on. Okay. <laughs> Um, well, Raja is Christian. <laughs> so, so for us, um, our struggle is a national liberation struggle. And I think that Israel um, tries to, uh, to make this into a religious um, issue and, and conflate, uh, uh, to conflate a national liberation struggle with, with Islam. Um, Palestine is a country of many religions. Islam is the dominant religion, but we have historically been a very multicultural, multi-religious, multi-ethnic society. Um, and the, the, the sort of this pitting, this pitting of Islam and the West is kind of an intentional design um, a, across the board. Um, and so many issues become conflated with, um, with this sort of, this mythical idea of Islam versus, or clash of civilizations or what have you. And, and Palestine is just kind of thrown into that mix as many other conflicts are. Um, and so, you know, when you're able to caric when you're able to make a caricature of a religion, of, 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 uh, of, of a group of one point some billion people, when you're able to reduce that to, to something very subhuman and angry and, and irrational and violent and so forth, then it's easy, then you just sort of, everything you don't like that can fit into that, it's easy to make, to make your propaganda by just putting them into that. But I think our job as writers is to tease things out, and this is something that, that Raja does very well, is to tease out the nuances of who we are and our interactions and our struggles and, and, and what Palestine is all about, so. Do you wanna, do you wanna expand on that? No, I, I perfectly agree that it's not a religious war that is happening, it's a nationalist war. Totally. And, and it's a struggle over uh, recognition of nations, the two nations have to recognize each other. Right. And, and human dignity and human rights. Yeah. Um, first of all, Raja, your book, Palestinian Walks, I read it, I, I don't know, it's many, many, many years ago now, and it's still one of my favorite books. It's, it is, you use, you use the word just now, nuanced, but it is, so, it is so illuminating and so so devastating, but so beautiful and poetic. It's just, I, I mean, it's, it's a world-opening uh, Effort. It's it's incredible. Do you have a question? Um, I, you've you've mentioned twice now in the previous session in this one this law making it illegal to commemorate the Nakba, and I would love to just be informed a little bit more about how that came to pass. Like, what was actually the when did that actually happen? Meaning the the law that was passed, and what was the sort of process around that? Well, uh, Israel is going through a, a process of. Uh, fanaticism and uh, uh, religious uh, control and the settlers who uh, now control the government and, and the fanatics who also control the government want to uh, introduce religion and, and suppress anything Palestinian. Even Arabic, the Arabic language is one of the official languages in Israel. They're trying to remove that as an of, uh, official language of Israel, although a quarter of the population in Israel are Arabs. Uh, and uh, the commemoration law uh, uh, makes it illegal to commemorate the Nakba, and if uh, an organization goes ahead and commemorates the Nakba, they will be denied funding, and, and, and their uh, uh, project will be closed down. So uh, this is, uh, this is r r very distressing that after more than almost 70 years now, they still cannot come to terms with what happened in 1948 and recognize that the Palestinians are a nation. But to me, it, the important thing is that they don't recognize the Palestinians as a nation. That is the most, uh, biggest obstacle to peace that I can see. Okay, we have five minutes, so please try to get to your questions sooner. Hello. Hello. Um, hi, I wanted to ask, with the current expansion of 
communication and social media. I mean, I guess more people know about the Palestinian cause than say 10 years ago. Do you think uh, social media and global communication about this is now making the Palestinian cause stronger? Is it possible to weaken the Israeli cause now? Has that changed? Has that impacted anything or are things the same? Well, I think that uh, the internet has made a difference. I don't know about the social media because I don't follow it and I don't have Twitter or Facebook or anything. So I can't really comment on the, the social media. But I think the internet has made a difference because uh, in the past, it, if you wanted to know and if you suspected that what you were fed by the establishment media was incorrect, you didn't have a possibility of finding out otherwise. Whereas now, it's all there. So whoever wants to can discover for themselves. And I think by and large, the Palestinian situation and the Palestinian cause is understood and, and supported by most people around the world. Even in Europe, even in the United States, I'm sure in this country as well, it's the governments who are not supportive of the Palestinians and who are not trying to bring peace. Um, yes. you, the gentleman here. Oh, sorry. Well, go ahead, Tim. And then... As on today, Egypt and Saudi Arabia and Jordan are the best friends of the Israel, which is totally a changed condition. Mm -hmm. Just like India, yeah. we have now very good relation with you. Do you hope that something will be solved by this new equation among Arab countries and Israel with the help of new policy of Trump, president of US? Thank you. Uh, sorry, are you asking, do, do we think that the, 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 that the cooperation between Saudi Arabia and Jordan and Israel can help us? <laughs> <laughs> not at all, not at all. And I think, <laughs> and I think the, the, these countries have uh, contributed very badly to the cause and are contributing very badly if they think that they can make peace without justice because peace without justice will not endure for a minute. The only thing good about what is happening with America and their policies towards Israel and their outward support of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel is that it's making it clear, which has been clear for us for many years, but more clearly, op openly clear, that Israel is not a neutral uh, sponsor of the peace process. And that is good. I think yes. I, I think uh, you... He partly asked my question, you partly answered, I think so. The question is this, for a long time, we were hoping that there would be a two-state two solution, which was the only viable solution for this problem. That was what we thought. With this present uh, Trump administration declaring Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, uh, is that hope gone forever? If there is any hope of this two-state solution being revived, well, I just would say that there's nothing forever. And uh, uh, eventually, the important thing is for the two uh, nations to recognize each other and find a way to live together. Now, how they will live together, whether in one state, two states, would need to be figured out. But the important, essential part of the equation is that they have to live together. And they have to find a way to share the land. How that borders. would be is... I'm sorry. is uh, Defined borders should be there, you know, for two states to exist, to coexist. So we, sorry, I'm sorry to cut you off. Um, we're going to have to end here. We have about 30 second, seconds left. Um, and I, I want to reiterate what uh, Raja said about, um, you know, sort of the solution not being based on these political sort of construct, but rather a solution that is based on human dignity um, and the idea that Palestinians um, are natives of that land, that we have been there. Um, and that we were always there and, and, we, and we should remain there and we deserve to live with the same kind of security and dignity and prosperity and opportunity that Jews who come from other countries with no familial connection to that land that they currently live in in our homes. So thank you all very much for coming. Thank you, Raja. This is a wonderful book. Again, if you haven't gotten it, this is it, Where the Line is Drawn.